Well, this morning we're going to wrap up the uh, book of Nehemiah. You know, one of the, a uh, couple of the themes throughout the book of Nehemiah, one has been restoration. We see a lot of restoration taking place in God's people. The other, of course, has been prayer. We've seen consistently through Nehemiah, uh, the people in Nehemiah specifically continually being drawn to prayer as difficulties arose. Throughout the last uh, two or three months, we've shared some stories of different people in our body. I want to share one final story with you this morning because I think it speaks well to the, uh, the theme of restoration and prayer. Listen to this. My name's Angelo Scalfaro. Uh, and I've been on drugs and alcohol pretty much my entire life. It was in uh, June of 2016 on Father's Day, actually, when my father died, which brought a whole new level of drug use in my life. It took me to a place that I don't want to ever go back, and I don't wish anybody to go there either. I lost everything. I lost my, my family, my house, my job, everything I've ever owned, I lost. Uh, it was in March or April of 2017. I met Walter Moon, who you know, helped me through some things. Uh, he's a man I owe a lot of things to. And he prayed for me as well. Uh, he led me in the direction, but you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Uh, so, you know, I had to make moves on my own uh, to get the help I needed, but I thought I could do it on my own, and, and uh, I just couldn't. I couldn't do it. I couldn't stop. Up until December 31st of 2017, New Year's Eve, uh, I was, felt like I was on my last breath. and I, I really thought I was going to die that night. And I was on my hands and knees crying out to God. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried, and I prayed, and I prayed. And uh, he brought me back to life, so to speak, gave me a little bit more energy to where I can get up off my knees, go to a place that I knew I needed to go, but I had too much pride to go, because I thought I could do it on my own. So I set aside my pride, made a phone call to John 3:16, and, uh, and got to a place of safety where you know, God led me to a place of safety. Got in January 14th of 2018. And in there, I got a relationship with Christ. And I learned how to pray. I learned how to pray and know Christ. Uh, and prayer means everything to me now. Prayer is part of my recovery. And I, I wouldn't be where I am today without prayer and others praying for me. And today, I, I feel great through prayer and knowing Christ. It's, it's changed my life. I've, I've got new friends. I've got my family back, a relationship with my uh, grandchildren, which I never had until now, uh, a place to live on my own. Without prayer, I wouldn't be where I was at now. Without others praying for me, I wouldn't be here now. But it's all about prayer and, uh, and getting that relationship with Christ. He's always been with me. He's never left, even through the worst times. And I think he wasn't there, but he's never left me. And I'm so grateful, and I'm so grateful to be a King's kid now. My advice to somebody else going through the same deal, uh, yeah, boy, is you got to get honest with yourself. You really have to get honest with yourself and know that you have a problem. You can't just expect help and not do anything about it. You have to want it, and you have to put a little work into doing it. Uh, you know, prayer helps. Prayer's Prayer means everything. Angelo is a very active part of our church body. He actually serves on our staff and our maintenance team, and I so appreciate his uh, <clears throat> courage and being willing to share that story. What a great reminder of God being about the work of restoration and how important prayer is in that work. All right, this morning we're jumping in at uh, chapter 11. You remember that last week they'd had a phenomenal uh, experience of worship where they had heard the word, prayed, confessed, uh, offered praise to the Lord. They renewed their commitment to him, their obedience to him. And now we jump into chapter 11. If you look at the first two verses with me, it says, Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, 
while nine out of ten remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. Now, let me, let me say a quick word about leaders before we, we jump totally in here. When it says the leaders of the people, this is not just Nehemiah and not just his, uh, his close co-workers, his team. It's not just the full-time leaders. The leaders of the people at this point, some of them were, were ordinary people. They had just been uh, part of the crowd, but they were people that God had raised up. Nehemiah, as a leader, understood the importance of developing leaders and delegating responsibility. And so now, these people have just been part of the, the uh, congregation of the crowd, if you will. Now these people have been raised up uh, to do the work. It's the same thing that God does in our day. God raises up people, not just full-time pastors and staff people, but God raises up people among the body to do the work of ministry. In fact, you understand, uh, Paul in Ephesians 4.12 explained, you understand that the role of pastors is not to do all the work. The role of pastors is to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. The work of ministry is accomplished by the entire body, not just the staff uh, who, who are full-time here. And, and there are going to be some in the body that are called to lead in, in various roles. Uh, some, of, some of these leaders, again, were regular people who had been developed and given areas of responsibility. Now, the leaders uh, are in the city. Um, there are enough people back in Israel at this time, they couldn't all fit in the city of Jerusalem. And many of them, their home places had been in the outlying towns and villages. But the problem is, at this point, the leaders are in the city, but the city is not fully populated. There are not enough people to, to fill the city. It was underpopulated. Why does that matter? Well, because Jerusalem was a holy city. It was the, the place that God had chosen as his dwelling place. So it was a city that was set apart from the world, and God did not intend for his city to be empty. He intended to, for his city to be filled with his people, a, a set-apart people. And we saw in chapters 8 through 10 that the people have repented, uh, they've committed to obey God, they, they've restored all the things that had lapsed during that uh, exile, they've separated themselves from the world as a holy people, and so now the time has come to fill the city. So you see in verse 2 it says that the leaders and the people decided that what they would do is cast lots so that 10% of those, one out of 10 who lived in those outlying villages, would move into Jerusalem. Now, why, why did they cast lots? Well, they were very dependent on God in every decision. They knew from their history, they knew from what they had just been through, that they want to be very careful to follow him completely. And at this time uh, in their history, casting lots was a pretty common way to determine the will of God. In their mind, casting lots left the decision up to God. I mean, think about it. Perhaps there were some people that really wanted to move in to the city to be within the walls. Perhaps there were some people who liked their, their more uh, rural lifestyle, and they didn't want to move into the city. Well, casting lots made sure that it was level ground, level playing field for everyone. No one of influence could affect the decision. They would cast lots, and those who were selected by lots would move into the city. Now, we don't cast lots today. You probably imagine that in our staff meetings on Mondays, we sit around the conference table and cast lots and pitch pennies and all that stuff. We don't do that. It's not how we make decisions. We don't need to make decisions that way today because there's something very different today that they didn't have in their day, and that is the fact that the Holy Spirit indwells the life of every believer. And because the Holy Spirit indwells us, we can know God's will. How do we know it? Well, primarily, we know it through His Word. He speaks to us through His Word. Now, that can happen in a variety of ways. It can happen in a Sunday school class. It can happen in a time like this. It can happen in a Bible study. It can happen uh, from a Christian friend or counselor speaking the truth of God's Word into your life. It can happen through inner conviction. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you should recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit, and he should be able to speak to you. It can even happen as God directs circumstances in your life. God can use any means he wishes to speak into our lives, his will and his purpose. What we have to do, what's important for us, is that we look to him and we trust him for guidance. That we seek his will, not seek his approval of our will and our plans. Well, they cast lots. Um, the, the walls have been rebuilt. The city's been uh, mostly restored. Not all the housing's been restored yet. The people needed to move back in order to be a witness to the skeptical Gentiles. They needed to show that not only had God not abandoned his city, he also had not abandoned his people. Now, think about this. Think about the simplicity of the fact that just by moving into the city, 
people are giving testimony to the greatness of God. That's all they had to do was move into the city. And I think sometimes we get hung up on the fact that, or the thought that we think doing something great for God means performing some kind of dramatic ministry. No, in this case, it was a simple obedience, and we could never underestimate the importance of simple obedience. In this case, simply being present where God wanted them to be was causing God's will to be worked out among his people. It's just a simple step of obedience. Verse 2 tells us, it says that the people blessed or they commended those who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. Now, uh, even Hebrew scholars are not sure, is this a second group who volunteered or is it talking about the group that was, that, that, uh, was drawn by Lot? We don't know, but for sure it appears that those who were going to live in Jerusalem uh, were willing to do that. They had a positive attitude about a move that was probably going to involve some sacrifice for them. You know, the housing situation in the city was not as good as it was outside the city at this point. They're going to have to leave their nice established homesteads, homes that they probably have, have built or restored and, and are living in. They, they probably, if they lived outside of the city, they enjoyed the rural environment. They're going to have to move back in. I enjoy a rural environment. We haven't lived in a neighborhood in 20 plus years. I can't imagine going back into a neighborhood. That just wasn't our style. Well, for them, they enjoyed the rural lifestyle, the environment. They're going to have to leave friends and neighbors. They're going to have to uproot their children from a comfortable environment. And most likely, those who move back into the city were going to be at a significant economic disadvantage because they're having to start all over. And yet, evidently, they were willing to relocate to strengthen the work of God. You know what they were doing? They were literally doing what Paul told all of us as believers to do in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's what they literally, physically were doing. They were presenting themselves as an offering to God. In his comment on Nehemiah, his commentary on Nehemiah, Chuck Swindoll calls these people the willing unknowns. We don't know who they were, but their willingness made a difference for the nation, a difference that impacted the nation. And as you look through chapter 11, and I'm not going to take time to read all these verses, but as you look through chapter 11, there are some names that are listed here. There are many names not listed, but there are a lot of willing unknowns. For example, in verse 12, it mentions 822 who worked within the temple. Uh, verses 15 through 16, the Levites, the leaders of the Levites who worked outside the house of God. There were those who worked in the temple to help facilitate worship. There were those who worked outside to take care of the building and the property, the grounds. Uh, verse 19, there were 172 gatekeepers. Verse 17, I love this one. Matanya, now you've never, you've never heard of him before, but his job, his name is mentioned. We don't know about him from anywhere else except this verse. But his job uh, was to lead or to direct thanksgiving and prayer. He was a leader who had an incredibly significant role, and nothing else is said about him except what he was responsible for. Now, think about his, his role. Can I tell you that his role was more important and more significant than the role of a preacher is? Because he was a prayer warrior. He led in prayer. Remember several years ago, I was reading a book about prayer from an unknown Christian, and it simply stated, the fruit belongs to the prayer, not the preacher. That's a great role. And many unsung heroes in the church today, our church and other churches, many unsung heroes are the people who do battle on their knees for the cause of Christ. All these people throughout chapter 11 that were what Swindoll calls willing unknowns. You know, and as you read chapter 11 and see uh, th those willing unknowns listed, sometimes just by number, not by name, it, it begs the question, am I willing to be a willing unknown? Would I be willing to do whatever it took to further God's plan and purpose for our church, for my neighborhood, for my city, for my place of work, for my school? Would I be willing, without recognition or anything, would I be willing to make sacrifice like they did to further God's plan and purpose? Now, you may say this morning, well, I'm not sure that God can use me. Listen, God uses people. All different gifts, all different abilities, all different personalities, all different temperaments. It's not about whether or not God will use you. It's about whether or not you would be willing for God to use you. Would you give yourself, in, in whatever way is necessary, uh, 
to help do what God wants done in the world, even if it's unpleasant or inconvenient. The willing unknowns. Now remember, the people had committed to give a tenth of their uh, income, a tenth of the, fir- the first fruits, a tenth of their income. They'd committed to give a tenth or a tithe to support the work of the temple. Now what they're doing is not only that, but they're giving a tithe of themselves. It's a tenth of the population to move back into the city of Jerusalem. Let's think about tithing yourself for just a minute. What if, in addition to your finances, what if you tithe yourself to the Lord? If you, let's say you sleep um, eight hours a day, that, that's an average, I know some more, some less. Let's say you sleep eight hours a day and you said, you know what, I'm going to tithe the other 16 hours of my day to the Lord. That's 96 minutes. A little over an hour and a half every day that you would spend either with the Lord or, or serving the Lord. Maybe you say, well, I've, I've got a job that just demands all my time. Okay, let's take the eight hours left after you're sleeping and after your job and say that you're going to tithe those eight hours every day. That's just 48 minutes. I dare say most of us probably don't think about God 48 minutes a day, much less spend the time with him or or serving him. And let me also mention, we have to remember the tithe is just symbolic. It acknowledges that God owns everything. I'm not suggesting to you today that you spend 48 minutes or 96 minutes with God and that's all you do, that that's good. No, you belong completely to him. But there's something about the recognition of that uh, through the tithe. Chapter 12. We're moving fast today. We've got three chapters to wrap this thing up. Chapter 12. The first 26 verses, you're going to see the list of many of the priests, uh, many of the Levites who led worship in the temple. We, we wouldn't know, we wouldn't recognize any of these names. I just point them out to say the names that are listed there of these priests and Levites are confirmation that worship was ongoing. Part of God's process in restoring his, his people included the blessing of enjoying his presence through worship. Let me say that again, just that phrase, enjoying the blessing of his presence in worship. We need to be very careful not to let our worship get mundane or or routine, but to recognize how valuable it is when we worship that we're able to connect and have relationship with the Father. That's why we're here. Verse 27, we're going to look at a very special occasion of worship. I'm going to read from 27 down through about 47. I'm going to I'll skip some places. I'll tell you what I'm skipping to help you stay with me. But let's look in chapter 12, beginning in verse 27, a very special worship time that they had. Verse 27, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings and with singing, with cymbals, harps, and lyres. And the sons of the singers gathered together from the districts surrounding Jerusalem and from the villages. Verse 30. And the priests and the Levites purified themselves, and they purified the people and the gates and the wall. Then I, that's Nehemiah, brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. One went to the south on the wall. Verse 32. Half the leaders of Judah went with that group. Verse 36, the last phrase. And Ezra the scribe went before them. So two choirs. One went south with half the people and Ezra the scribe. Verse 38, the other choir of those who gave thanks went to the north, and I followed them with half of the people on the wall. And then verse 40, one choir going north, one going south. They meet where? At the temple. Both choirs of those who gave thanks stood in the house of God, and I and half the officials with me. And they offered great sacrifices on that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. On that day, men were appointed over the storerooms, the contributions, the first fruits, and the tithes to gather them into the portions required by the law for the priests and for the Levites, according to the fields of the towns for Judah received over the priests and the Levites, rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered. And they performed the service of their God and the service of purification, as did the singers and the gatekeepers, according to the command of David and his son Solomon. For long ago, in the days of David and Asaph, there were directors of the singers, and there were songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. And all Israel, in the days of Zerubbabel, in the days of Nehemiah, gave the daily portions for the singers and the gatekeepers, and they set apart that which was for the Levites, and the Levites set apart that which was for the sons of of Aaron. So what's happening here? Well, the people in, in chapters 8 through 10 had been dedicated. 
and now it's time to dedicate the work that they have done, that is the building of the wall. And so the Levites, who are the lead worshipers, gather. Uh, you see that there are instruments, there are singers, there are even two choirs. But in verse 30, it says the first thing they did was to purify themselves. Now, it makes sense that they purified themselves as leaders. It makes sense that they purified the people. What's interesting in this passage is the fact that they purified the gates and the walls. In the Old Testament, purification was about uh, making something, preparing something or, or someone for a holy purpose to be used by God. You had to purify the object, if it was an object, or the person to be used. The, the temple utensils were always purified before worship. The priest was purified uh, before he served. The people were purified before they came into the Lord's presence. But here it says that the walls and the gates were purified. This is the only place in Scripture that city walls are purified. Why? Because Jerusalem is a holy city. It's a city that is set apart for the purpose of God. Now, when you think about the, the purification Obviously, ritual purification is not necessary anymore today. Uh, none of the pastors, the, the worship leaders, none of those you see up here leading in worship have to go through any special purification. That's not uh, part of what we do today. But I would say we have to remember that the whole purpose of their ritual purification was to prepare them in the way that we prepare to be in the presence of God, to be used by God, is making sure that we have clean hearts. The greatest detriment to our worship and the greatest detriment to our service of the Lord is sin. God's, God's eyes are so holy and so pure, he can't look on evil and sin. And, and so the filth of sin in our lives, before we come to worship, before we're able to serve the Lord, the filth of sin has to be washed away. And so what we read about in these purification rituals is symbolic of the need for spiritual cleansing. We need to be careful that we're clean before the Lord before we come to worship and before we seek to, uh, to serve him. So after the purification there in verse 30, there's a great celebration of thanksgiving and praise by everyone, not just the worship leaders. I'm not going to beat you guys up again this week like I did last week about what you do during worship, but everyone was involved in worship. In this chapter, you see singing mentioned eight times, thanksgiving mentioned six times, and rejoicing seven times. And notice the worship was led, the celebration was led by choirs, and where were the choirs? Where were the people? They were on the walls. Now, the wall was probably about eight feet wide, but when you think about it being on the walls, I want you to remember in the very beginning when they were starting on the walls, you remember Sanballat and Tobiah? You remember those two guys? You remember one of the things that they said to ridicule the people? If even a what jumps on the wall? A fox. If even a fox jumps on this wall, it's going to be rubble. The entire congregation is on the wall, and they circle the city, one choir going north, one south, and they meet up at the temple. Now, why was the dedication done this way? Why didn't they just gather in the temple and have a big service and a celebration? Why did they go out and actually have the dedication on the walls? Well, first of all, the people... We're getting to see and touch and be reminded of the hand of God as they did this work. Can you imagine the memories that brought back to those who were working on the wall? It's a great reminder. Secondly, the people were bearing witness to a watching world. They were glorifying God because of what he had done. Again, Sanballat and Tobiah and others ridiculed them and made fun of them and said they won't get this work done. If even a fox jumps on it, it'll fall down. And so they're bearing witness to the work that God has done as they march on the walls. Marching on the walls also let them see the big picture. There were probably some who had not even seen sections of the wall. You remember each, each group had their section that they worked on. Maybe they'd never had opportunity to see, and now they're able to see, look what happens when we all come together, when we all work together, when we're unified. They're able to see what happens when everyone does their part. Also, marching on the walls symbolized claiming the city for God. It's not uncommon as you read through the, uh, the Old Testament and as you understand the culture, it's not uncommon to march around a property to claim it. That's usually how property was claimed. You would march around that property. Now, what are they doing? They're marching around the walls and they're doing what, what Joshua had done when they claimed the land for God. You remember God told Joshua every place in Joshua chapter 1, every place the sole of your foot treads, that I'm giving to you. And so they're claiming, they're reclaiming, if you will, the city for the Lord. 
you know, when you think about them going out and, and having this dedication and, and marching on the wall and claiming the city, you recognize that sometimes we can miss some of God's greatest blessings just because we don't step out just because we're not willing to step out and claim what God has called us to claim. Verse 43 says, The rejoicing was so great it was heard far away. People outside the city, people who weren't uh, Israelites, heard the rejoicing that was happening. And then after they rejoiced and after they celebrated, after they had this great time of dedication, then they kept the promise they had made of supporting the temple and the ministry there. Remember last week, we talked about that. They said the house of God will not be neglected, and they made a commitment to support the work there. And you see that happening, verses 44 through 47. They brought their tithes, they brought their offerings, and those were gathered into the storerooms of the temple. Now, just a reminder, before a person can bring a tithe or an offering that honors the Lord first, before bringing material gifts, before those gifts can be spiritual sacrifices, first, the people have to give of themselves. God is not interested in their worship. God is not interested in their gifts if they have not given of themselves to him. And they have done that, and now they're bringing their tithes and and their offerings and dedicating those to the Lord. Well, that gets us through chapter 12, and unfortunately, chapter 12 doesn't end with, and they lived happily ever after. I don't know if you've read ahead to chapter 13, but it's certainly not a pretty picture. Here at the end of chapter 12... Things in Jerusalem probably couldn't be better spiritually. I mean, think of where we've been last week and this week. They've, they've shown their commitment to Scripture. They've sincerely repented. They've renewed their loyalty to God's covenant, the fact that they're going to obey his covenant. They've willingly now moved back into Jerusalem. There's incredible joy and thanks as they dedicate the walls. They supported the work of the temple and the spiritual leaders. If you look at the first three verses of chapter 13, they're continuing to hear The book of the law being read and they're obeying what they heard. In those first three verses of chapter 13, they're reminded that they're not to be associated with the Ammonites and the Moabites. They're not to be a part of them because it was the Ammonites and Moabites who mistreated them in the wilderness. They didn't bring them food and water. They actually got Balaam to try to call a curse down on them as God's people. And so God said, you're to have nothing to do with these people. And so you see in those first three verses of chapter 13, they hear the law and they say, that's right. And they separate themselves than the Ammonites and the Moabites. They're at a great point. Incredible revival, incredible renewal has happened to the people of God. Imagine what that would look like in our day. What an incredibly high point for God's people. The story doesn't end there. Unfortunately, their obedience as God's people was short-lived. Let me mention to you, between chapter 13, verse 3, and verse 6, there's a 12-year gap. Nehemiah has returned to Artaxerxes in Persia after the walls have been completed and dedicated. He goes back to serve the king. And then in chapter 6, it's 12 years later, he comes back to Jerusalem to find out they've already violated four of the promises they'd made to the Lord. Chapter 13, verses 4 through 6, in, in his absence, in Nehemiah's absence, there's been a compromise. Tobiah, you remember Tobiah, Tobiah and Sanballat? Tobiah, one of the enemies of the people of God, one of the ones who had tried to prevent the reconstruction, has been given room and board in the temple. Eliashib, the the priest, has given him a room, the temple storeroom. So the storeroom is being misused. The storeroom's purpose was for food and for the gifts, for the offerings to be stored, and he's given that to Tobiah to, to live in. And the other problem with that violation is that Tobiah is an Ammonite. And so Tobiah has been given access to the temple area, to the center of worship, in direct violation to God's command and and the commitment that the people had made. And so Nehemiah very simply throws him out, throws his stuff out. He purifies the storeroom. Nehemiah is not going to allow for one moment of compromise with regard to holiness. Second violation, in verses 10 through 14, they had promised they would not neglect the house of God. They would support it. With their tithes and offerings, verses 10 through 14 says the people had not been giving. As a result, the Levites, who were dependent on those tithes and offerings for their support, the Levites have basically left the city. They've gone back to farming. And so you can imagine what's happening with the worship of God. It's suffered. You know what? You, you, can, you can mark it down. When someone, when, when a believer begins to grow distant from the Lord, when a believer begins to decline spiritually, the first place you'll notice it is, 
is in their giving. And the people had begun to drift from their relationship with the Lord, and they stopped giving, and the Levites had no support, and so they're off doing other things. It's no surprise that after those first two violations of the temple and worship, the third violation there in verses 15 through 22 is that they're now neglecting the Sabbath. Verse 15 through 22 tells us that they're working and they're doing business on the Sabbath, a direct reversal of their commitment to honor the Lord and honor the Sabbath. Now, Nehemiah is a very practical man. He doesn't just uh, rebuke them. He doesn't just uh, get onto them. We saw that he threw Tobiah um, out of the temple area to deal with that issue. We see that uh, Nehemiah, in, in coming to them, and the different uh, violations they've committed, Nehemiah deals with each one of those in a very practical way. He puts treasures in the storeroom to make sure the offerings are coming. He basically tells those, by the way, the Sabbath problem was not just Jewish people, it was their neighbors. He has the gates closed um, before the Sabbath and kept closed during the Sabbath, but he also tells those who are coming to the gates, they keep coming, even though the gates are closed, these neighboring merchants keep coming, and he tells them, if you look in verse 21, he basically tells them, you don't want none of me. Now, I don't know what Nehemiah looked like. I don't know if he's a big burly kind of guy or what, but he basically tells those guys, you keep showing up here. You keep tempting the people of God to do business with you, and I'm going to lay hands on you, and they don't come back. Well, the fourth issue Nehemiah has to deal with is the issue of intermarriage with, with the pagan peoples who worship foreign gods. The very thing that they had agreed to do, to separate themselves from the world, they had violated. They're now intermarrying with the peoples around them. And these are not peoples who worship the Lord God. These are people who worship other gods. And he even tells me, he said, do you guys not think about Solomon? You remember that Solomon was the greatest king, the most wise king of our nation, except that he led Israel into sin because of foreign women. Solomon got involved with foreign women and led Israel into the sin of idolatry. And when the Israelites throughout their history, anytime they're intermarried with people who worship other gods, they were inevitably tempted to idolatry. Listen, this wasn't a, a skin issue when we talk about intermarriage. It was a spiritual issue. They were engaging with people who didn't worship God, and they were often led into idolatry because of that. Now, I don't think I need to make the obvious statement here about the importance of a committed Christ follower marrying a committed Christ follower. I don't think I need to make that statement, but I will. To those of you who are single, if you're going to walk with God, if you're going to honor God, if you're going to serve God in a way that you finish well, you cannot compromise on this point. Listen to me. There are much worse things than being single for your entire life. There are much worse things than being single for your entire life. Young ladies, if you get all antsy and you feel like your bio biological clock is ticking and you get worried there may not be someone else and you marry a young man who does not walk with God, you will regret it for the rest of your life. And I can introduce you to plenty of people right here in this body who would give that testimony to you from experience. They would wish that their experience had been different. You can't compromise on this point. If you're a committed Christ follower, you need to be uh, married to a committed Christ follower. Now, Nehemiah has them take an oath that they will no longer intermarry. We understand that. You might have trouble with the first part of verse 25, on the intermarriage issue, he says, and I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. <laughs> now, the only person whose hair I ever remember pulling was, was my sister's hair, but she was older and she was mean and she was a sinner. <laughs> Just telling you. Now, what you're seeing here is, is culturally this thing of beating them, calling down curse on them, pulling their hair, pulling out their hair, that's a way of dishonoring these men. Nehemiah is trying to paint the picture that intermarrying foreigners has, foreigners has shameful consequences. That's all that is. It's a, it's a cultural thing, okay? Please don't go around pulling out anybody's hair if you catch them in sin, all right? Unless it's your older mean sister. <laughs> 
Chapter 13, the first four words of verse 30, this is where we're going to land today, the first four words of verse 30 sums up Nehemiah's work in Jerusalem when, when he returned. Look at those four words. Thus I cleanse them. Now think about the fact. These people have had this incredible experience with God that we looked at in chapters 8 through 10, this incredible renewal, this incredible revival, the, this, this commitment of their covenant relationship. They, they celebrate what God has done, um, and, and they have that dedication on the city walls. Now, they're either living in the city, or they come to the city for business, or maybe they live close enough they can see the walls. So it's not like all of a sudden they forget what God has done. Every day they have a visual reminder of what God has done, and yet in chapter 13 they completely fall apart. Listen, we've got to remember, no matter how strong our relationship with the Lord is today, we've got to remember we are in constant need of renewal and repentance. Do you know that in a a lot of countries, talking about followers of Christ, they don't use the name Christian because it can be misunderstood. You know what they call themselves in a lot of other countries? They call themselves repenters. You see, repentance is not a one-time thing when you come to Christ. You do need to repent and turn from your sin and turn to Christ. But repentance is also a daily action that we have to take because daily the world is coming against us and we're getting tainted and we're getting covered with the filth of the world and we daily have to repent. No matter how good our intentions are, our natural inclination is not to keep our commitment to the Lord. It's not to live God-honoring lives. That's not our natural inclination. We're in constant need of reformation. Well, let me mention for you this morning, because I think it's important to say, well, what what do we take away um, from God's Word? What what is it here that we need to apply to our lives? There are several things we covered today. What about the issue of simple obedience? God's looking for simple obedience. He's, you don't need to be sitting around waiting to think of some big thing God is going to call you to do. He's looking for simple obedience. The simple obedience of people being willing to move where God wanted them to move was enough to bring glory to him. What about being a willing unknown? Would I be willing to do whatever God calls me to do, no matter how inconvenient, no matter, no matter how difficult it might be, would I be willing to do that to give myself in whatever way God needs me to give to advance his purposes? Am I willing to be a living sacrifice? And then, as we finished up here in chapter 13, do I understand the need for constant reformation? It doesn't matter who the most spiritual, most godly person in this room is today. It doesn't matter who it is because tomorrow that person could fall to a depth that is beyond our imagination knowing that they're godly and spiritual. Daily, we need reformation. Daily, we need to have an attitude of repentance. God, what in my life is not pleasing to you? What do I need to do today to confess and to repent to be the person you've called me to be?